Tonight, live from the BBC's Broadcasting House in London, Nick Clegg and Nigel Farage set out their arguments for and against. Well, welcome, welcome, thank you, welcome to the BBC's Radio Theatre for tonight's live debate on Britain's membership of the European Union. Between the Deputy Prime Minister and Leader of the Liberal Democrats, Nick Clegg, and Nigel Farage, Leader of the UK Independence Party. Now, the rules for this debate are fairly simple. Each will make a one-minute opening statement, and they have one minute to start off the debate on every topic we cover. And at the end of the hour, another minute each to summarise their positions. Questions are going to come from our audience here, who've been chosen to represent both sides of the case, and undecideds as well, or from emails. And neither side, of course, has seen the questions in advance. Now, if you want to join the debate, use the hashtag EuropeDebate, that's one word, or go to the BBC's webpage, where you can also find scrutiny of the arguments being put forward. bbc.co.uk slash politics is the site. Uh, Nigel Farage and Nick Clegg drew straws to decide who should start, and Nigel Farage drew the short or the long straw, depending on his view. I don't know which, but anyway, he's going to start. Mr. Farage. Thank you. It's 40 years since the BBC debated this great question. Uh, the one thing that has remained the same, of course, is David Dimbleby. Well, almost. Uh, but apart from that, everything's changed, because in those days, we were asked to stay part of a common market. It was all about trade, if you remember. Well, it wasn't true. Uh, and we find ourselves today part of a political union. Uh, we find most of our laws being made somewhere else. Uh, we find it's all rather expensive. And we have open door immigration. Indeed, if you put to a referendum today, would we join that union? Overwhelmingly, we would say no. And there's now a clear, settled majority opinion in this country which, which says, look, we're not anti-European. We want to trade with Europe, cooperate with Europe, and get on well with our next door neighbors. But we don't want a part of political union. There's an obstacle, though, and the obstacle uh, is here tonight in the form of Nick Clegg. It's the career political class and their friends in big business. They want us to keep this status quo, and I want Britain to get up off its knees. Let's govern ourselves again, stand tall, and trade with the world. Nick Clegg. Uh, tonight I'm going to ask you to remember just one thing. If it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. You've just heard it from Nigel Farage. You'll hear it from him all evening. He'll say that we can quit the European Union, we can isolate ourselves in the world and still protect jobs, still protect trade, still punch above our weight. That we can have all the good things of being in Europe without actually being in Europe. It's a dangerous con because the modern world has changed. Our economies are now intertwined with each other. We have to work with other countries to protect jobs, to protect trade, to make sure that Britain is richer, stronger and safer. And for us as a country to thrive and prosper, we should do what we do at our best. Not walk away, but to work with others and lead. Because in an uncertain world, there is strength in numbers. That is why we should remain in the European Union. Right, let's go to our first question, which comes from Hannah Lippitt. For many, staying or leaving the EU is a question of personal principle. What principles do you both base your viewpoints on? What principles do you base your viewpoints on, Nick Clegg? What's best for Britain, quite simply. And I just think in this, in this modern world, where there are so many things that we can't do on our own, you can't deal with climate change on your own, you can't go after criminals who cross borders on your own, you can't deal with terrorism on your own. We have, to, we have to compete to make sure that people invest in our country to create jobs. All of that means that we get more out of the world by working together with other countries. Now, if you do what Nigel Farage recommends and you isolate Britain, a sort of Billy No Mates Britain, well, it'd be worse than that. It'd be a sort of Billy No Jobs Britain, a Billy No Influence Britain. Working together with others is not a bad thing. It actually strengthens us. It doesn't weaken us. Nigel Farage. Hannah, I spent 20 years in business. I'm not a career politician. Uh, I got involved in this because I realised with the succession of treaties that we were signing up to, we were giving away our birthright. 
We're giving away the ability to govern ourselves. And the principle that drives my entire political career is I believe the best people to govern Britain are the British people themselves. And I have to say, democracy matters. Generations before us fought and died to defend it. And you cannot be a democratic, self-governing nation and a member of this political European Union. I don't want to be isolated, Nick, far from it. I want us to trade with Europe and cooperate with Europe. There is nowhere else in the world where you have to be in political union to do business with each other. I want a modern business approach, but one that is based on patriotic values. Let's be an independent United Kingdom. And when we succeed in doing that, I want the rest of Europe to free themselves from the European Union too. Okay. Of course, he says... He says this is too good to be true. Well, it's not, because if you think about it, I mean, the only uh, countries in the European time zone, Ukraine and Belarus, are the only ones that haven't got free trade. When we joined the common market, when you hosted that debate, we were living in a world of tariffs, high manufacturing tariffs. That's all disappeared with globalisation. And we now find ourselves actually incapable of making our own trade deals with the emerging economies mm. of the world. So trade with Europe, and don't forget, they sell us more than we sell them. Trade with Europe, but let's open ourselves up to a bigger 21st century world. The, the question, of course, was about the principles, not, I suppose, the practicalities. I think, I think the values, which was Hannah's question, the values are how do you, in a modern world where, where there are so many threats, challenges, and, yes, opportunities, in the modern world, how do you make sure that we keep ourselves safe, that we keep ourselves strong, that we have jobs in this country? You know, if you don't want to believe me or even Nigel Farage, just listen to the people today who, who employ 700,000 of our fellow citizens in the, in the burgeoning British car industry. They could not have been clearer. 92% of them said it would be crazy to leave the European <laughs> Union. Because we, by the way, these are the car manufacturers. Yeah, Nigel yeah, Farage yeah, yeah. No, last no, 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 week no, no. said produce no, poor no, no, no. cars. They produce brilliant cars and they export them to the rest of the European Union. And they said, don't pull out the rug from under our industry. It means that more people will be unemployed. I'm simply not prepared to see joblessness go up. So if you really want perhaps the most important value of all, it's keeping people in work, giving people pay packets, hard cash in their pockets, so they can look after themselves and their own families. Nick, Nick, that report, that KPMG report, what you should have done is to read the small print. I know you're keen on things like that from last week. And what the small print said was that actually 62% of the people that were surveyed in that British car manufacturer interview, they want serious reform within the European Union if they're going to stay as members. So far from the top line being true, two-thirds of them are saying, unless we get reform, then the time has come to leave but how the do you EU. reform something if you just simply walk away from it? Well, this is the problem. Time well, and time again, Nigel Farage has had the opportunity, as have other British MEPs, to stand up for Britain, to vote, for instance, for a cut in the budget, to vote for British business. Tomorrow, there is a vote in the European Parliament, I'm not sure if Nigel Farage is going to vote for it, which would eliminate all the roaming charges that everybody, we all face when we go on holiday elsewhere, just imagine, no, no more of those extortionate roaming charges when you go on holiday, when you want to send a text, when you want to make a call. That's something he could actually do in Europe, but time and time and time again, when he has the opportunity to do it, he doesn't. Right, if you sure. want to reform yeah. something, no, you've well, got to lead let's within not, it. Let's not get bogged down too much in the detail of 65% here and the number of mm. rolling things. At this stage, I'm sure you'll have a chance to bog yourself down in detail <laughs> later if you want to. But I want to take this question um, from Charles Hudson, please. How can Britain face up to international challenges like Russian intervention in Crimea without the political weight which comes from being part of the European Union? So political weight coming from the European Union. Nigel Farage. Uh, by not uh, becoming uh, a political union with an expansionist foreign policy, uh, with an aim to militarise as quickly as they can. Indeed, Baroness Cathy Ashton, the British uh, Commissioner, is pushing very hard for a European Air Force and for a series of drones. Uh, and if you actually look at what's happened... Uh, with the Ukraine. We've had a message that's been sent out now for 10 years, and this is not just the EU. Indeed, uh, David Cameron, uh, Nick Clegg, and, and I'm afraid Ed Miliband too, have all been saying to the Ukraine, look, why don't you come and join the European Union? While you're at it, why don't you join NATO too? And this is something that has been seen by Putin to be a deeply provocative act. We have given false hope to those Western Ukrainians, and did you see them with their EU flags and their banners? They actually toppled a democratically elected leader. Yes, I know Ukraine's corrupt. I know he wasn't perfect, but they toppled a leader. And I do not want to be part of an emerging expansionist EU foreign policy. I think it will be a danger to peace. Yes,
Well, I have to say, listening to that, it seems to me if I'm the leader of the party of in, Nigel Farage is the leader of Putin. And it's just extraordinary really? that his loathing of the European Union is so all-consuming that he is now seeking to justify and defend the actions of a man, Vladimir Putin, who, let's not, you know, let's, let's, Ukraine is one thing. Look what's happening in Syria. He is the only man on the planet who, with one telephone call to, to President Assad, the most brutal dictator in the world, could actually help bring the participants to that awful, awful conflict to the negotiating table. There are 200 people dying in Syria, being mowed down in Syria, being killed in Syria every single day, and Nigel Farage says he admires he admires the way that Vladimir Putin has played, as if it's a game, as if it's a game, the terrible humanitarian catastrophe in Syria. He admires how Vladimir Putin has behaved there. That is why I think Nigel Farage's position is absolutely indefensible. Well, Nick, you, um, as Deputy Prime Minister, uh, were happy to go and bomb Libya. Uh, you did that, and three and a half years on, the situation in Libya is worse than it was. You were absolutely hell-bent on getting involved militarily in the war in Syria. And I, personally, am delighted we didn't go to war in Syria and we're not going to get involved, I hope, in military conflict in the Ukraine. The British people have had enough of endless foreign military interventions. The situation in the, in, in the Ukraine, in Syria, in Libya, these aren't simple black and white issues. And just to assume that if you support the rebels, you're supporting the good guys, frankly, That's flies the in the point. face That's of history, and that, we should not. That... We should not be intervening. And I am not... I don't admire Putin. What I said was he'd outwitted and outclassed you all over Syria. I also said I didn't like him as a human being and I wouldn't want to live in I'm Russia. Not, I'm not yeah, asking, but I'm what not I want asking, us to sorry, do, uh, let's not meddle. You, you did, let's not meddle. Not, it's, 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 hang on, just before you go yeah. on, you did actually say you admired him. As an the, operator, the not as a human was, being. The question was which current world leader do yeah. you most admire? As an operator, I would say Putin. Yes, and I then went on to say, David, that as a human being and with what he was doing, imprisoning journalists, I did not support the man. But can I just address Nick Clegg's point uh, about Putin could have made one telephone call to Assad and that would have stopped? Well, I think if Putin had not pointed out that the use of sarin gas had not necessarily come from the Assad regime, if he hadn't done oh, that, I on. suspect the backbench rebels would not have defeated Nigel you, Farage, Nick, in stopping Nigel, us President from Assad. going to... You wanted us to go to war again. I'm pleased no. that your backbenchers no. voted against you, and Putin... I don't like the man, All right, but Nick he contributed Clegg, to that debate. Nick Clegg, your turn. Listen, he... President Assad denied that chemical weapons existed. It now transpires that he had the largest stockpile of these abominable weapons anywhere on the planet. Now, let's be quite clear what Nigel Farage said. He said about Putin, the way he played the whole Syria thing, brilliant, as if it's a game. This isn't some sort of pub bar sort of discussion. Yeah. This is a serious issue about how we stop the slaughter, the displacement of millions of people, women and children being sexually abused, terrible violence on an unimaginable scale, and all that Nigel Farage can say, all he can say is, it was, he's played it brilliantly. This is, a, this is an issue where, quite rightly, we in Britain because we see this devastating humanitarian uh, crisis on our television screens, we want to work with others to do something about it. Nigel Farage doesn't no. want to work with the Americans, he doesn't want to work with the rest of no. Europe, he only wants to side with Vladimir Putin, who's the only no. man, as I say, with one telephone call, who could bring this bloody conflict Nick. to an end. So, so, Nick Clegg, sorry, uh, just, Nick Clegg, can you, can you come back to the question that Charles Hudson asked then? In what sense do we have political weight from being part of the European Union? And to what success in the Ukraine or Syria do you point that justifies it? Look, we are part in the European Union, uh, Charles asked the question, of what is the world's largest economy, right? 500 million people, shoppers, who can buy our goods, who can buy our services. But they don't only buy our goods and services, and contrary to what you just heard from Nigel Farage, we export 50% of the things we produce to the European Union. No, they only don't. export 8% to no, us. No. But crucially, they also <laughs> buy and sell as an economic superpower oh, dear, in dear. this part of the world, from Ukraine, from Russia, from the Middle East, from other parts of, the, of many countries uh, in our neck of the woods. So we have huge economic clout, which of course Vladimir Putin, mm. which of course people in the Middle East will listen to. We don't have that if we are simply to isolate ourselves and cut ourselves off from our own European neighbours. Look, look, I think you misunderstand. The whole point of this debate is 40 years on. 40 years ago, it was a common market. 
Now it's the European Union that wants an Air Force, an Army, a Navy, and wants to militarily intervene. In indeed, your senior, your, one of your own senior MEPs, wanted missile strikes to be launched against Syria uh, until, you know, you were beaten there in the House of Commons. No, this, country, just this country, Nick, has had enough of getting involved in endless foreign wars. But these are, whether it's, whether these are it's dangerous. You, whether it's you doing it or anybody else doing these it. Are, and there is no evidence... Hang on, hang on. There is no evidence that our military intervention in these countries is making life better. As that's I say, not, that's with you not as Deputy Charles Prime Minister, that's not the with question. you as Deputy Prime Minister, we bombed Libya, and it's worse now than no, it was it, then. And the answer to Charles's question is, I don't want to be part of a European foreign policy. The problem... But this is a dangerous fantasy. <coughs> the idea that there's going to be a European Air Force, a European Army, it's it proposed. is simply not true. Oh, the dear, prob dear, the dear. problem with people like Nigel Farage is they, 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 they swing at windmills. They see do? conspiracies everywhere. I wouldn't do? be surprised if Nigel Farage s soon tells us that the moon landing was a do? fake, that Barack Obama isn't American, that Elvis isn't dead. <laughs> You know, why it is not going to happen. Stop. Why do you Stop. deny he claimed your last week, He claimed last why do you week, deny your he claimed union, last week that 485 million people were going to vacate the whole of the rest of the European continent and turn up in Britain, leaving no human habitation left in the rest when of Europe. It's as silly as me saying that 5 million people living in Scotland might all move to Orpington next Tuesday. Right. It no, isn't going to no, happen. Nigel Farage. Nick, Nick, when are you going to start confronting few simple truths and stop twisting the facts the way you did last week and you're doing this week. You're doing it again. You're saying that I said 485 million people would come to Britain. I didn't. I said they were able to. You came up with the most twisted trade figure so I've ever heard. And last week you even said you try to tell the British people that only 7% of our national laws emanate in the European Union. That's true. I thought you believed in the European project. You and I both know that the whole point of the Constitution, which you supported, was to make the European Union an economic and a military superpower. No, no, no. And now you deny no. yes. the fact they're trying to build a European Air Force. It is a dangerous it's about time, fantasy. It's about... Well, it you said... You keep using this word, fantasy. Well, it is a fantasy. why it is you deny? I thought you were here to defend the European Union. No, they want an I army, want to, navy I want and to, air force. I also want to explain the truth and the reality well, it's not this true, fantasy it? world, which, oh, you dear, keep, dear, dear. which you keep talking about, which simply doesn't exist. It's just saying, saying that, oh, I only said 485 <laughs> people are entitled right. to move here. It's like me yeah. saying, well... Five million Scottish people are entitled to move to Orpington. Okay, it's not going to happen. OK, we've got to move on. Can I just ask you one yeah. point, something you said a moment ago? I just want to clarify what you said, if that's the right way to put it. You said that a, a Democrat in Ukraine was overthrown, suggesting that the, you weren't on the side of the demonstrations against Yanukovych. Uh, what no, was I your view people, about the shooting by people, snipers of the demonstrations? Look, look, I don't want David, to... my whole point is that the situation in these countries is deeply complex... There is no evidence that our intervening will make them better. I don't want us to get involved. It's not our business. We can't right. make it better. That's the point I'm trying right. to make. Now, let's, let's, let's go on. Uh, we'll move on, I think, next to uh, immigration, which is a, a key part, of course, of EU membership, the free movement of people, which means citizens of member states are free, as they were talking about a moment ago, to live and work in other EU countries. Uh, Kerry Francis has our first question on this subject. Kerry Francis, please. Uh, although I believe immigration is essential to all European countries' economies, I do think it needs to be controlled, and I'm concerned the UK's infrastructure can't cope with the current high levels. How would you address that? I'm concerned that the UK's infrastructure can't cope with present levels. Nick Clegg. I think you're, you're right, Kerry, to make sure, <coughs> to, to, to highlight that we need to make sure that as people move in, in, in the, into this country, and indeed as they move out, about one and a half million people from elsewhere in the European Union have come to our country since 2004. About half of those have gone back home. There are about one and a half million Brits elsewhere in the European Union. So there are people moving in and out. You need to make sure, as you say, that the, that the checks we've got in place, the infrastructure we've got in place, the support for our public services is in place. That's one of the reasons, for instance, that we're changing and have changed dramatically in this coalition government, the benefit rules. So people can't just turn up and claim benefits, no questions asked, no strings attached on the first day that they arrive. It's why uh, I think we should reinstate the exit checks that were taken away by previous governments so we can count people out just as well as counting people in. But we've got to be absolutely clear that... Uh, that this is a two-way street and it is really important to create jobs in this country. One in seven of all businesses in this country have been established by people who've come from elsewhere in the world to pay their taxes and to put more into the coffers rather than to take out. Nigel Farage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the impact on public services isn't, isn't really discussed enough here. 
Um, it's interesting, when the Labour government predicted 13,000 people extra would come a year from Eastern Europe and Nick Clegg wrote in The Guardian, don't worry chaps, it'll just be a wee trickle, uh, we saw a migratory wave come to Britain we could never <coughs> have predicted. Um, and we're still in that territory, I'm afraid, because uh, the big increase in net migration last year came almost solely from the European Union. And we have, of course, in the Eurozone, some very perilous uh, problems in Spain and Italy. And the difficulty is we can't plan anything. Because we don't know how many are going to come, we can't plan anything. We have uh, a chronic problem in schools with the National Audit Office saying we need, to, we need to make a quarter of a million new primary school places immediately. And housing, goodness me, we need to build a house every seven minutes just to cope with immigration into this country. So whichever way you look at it, we have got huge problems with a population over which we have no control at all. Well, of course, Kerry, as ever, it's simply not true to say that anyone can uh, come here. People can only come here from the European Union and stay here and stay <coughs> here if they want to support themselves, if they want to work, if they are, if they are students. And I, I would just simply say that we need to have a level-headed debate. It's a really difficult debate. It's a lot of people are very anxious about immigration. But let me just show Last week, I told you about the way that, the, the, that the UKIP had said that 29 million Bulgarians and Romanians might come to this country when there aren't even 29 million Bulgarians uh, and Romanians in those two countries. This, let me just show you this is a leaflet from, from UKIP. It says here, it's a, it's a picture of a very unhappy looking Native American. It says, he used to ignore immigration, now he lives on a reservation. The suggestion being that if we ignore immigration, the British people will be cooped up on a reservation. Nigel Farage, we are not, by staying in the European Union, we are not going to be cooped up on our on a Native American reservation. What are you going to say next? That you're a crazy horse or sitting bull? We've got to have a level-headed debate about these um, things. I don't know that leaflet, Nick, but... but well, it's you your want to comment briefly it's on your that? Leaflet. Hang on, hang on. Do you want to comment briefly on that? Yeah. I don't recognise that leaflet, but I will so say this to you. Leaflet, to try, well, yeah. well, all sorts of things get put out. I don't recognise that leaflet, and I certainly wouldn't endorse its sentiments, but I would say this, that it's actually bad news for ordinary British workers and families that we've had over the course of the last decade because of an excess in the labour market, I'm not talking about benefits, the labour market, we've had wage compression where wages have gone down by 14% in real terms since 2007. We've had a doubling of youth unemployment. It's good for the rich because it's cheaper nannies and cheaper chauffeurs and cheaper gardeners, but it's bad news for ordinary Britons. We need to have a control on immigration, over the numbers we come here, and over the quality of people that come here. And I don't want us to discriminate against India and New Zealand because we have an open door to Bulgaria and Romania. Let's have an immigration policy right. based on quality. And Nick, and Nick, Nick, Nick Clegg, you're, I don't want you to go into the numbers because you didn't answer the nub of the question by using the pamphlet, which was about the infrastructure. Yes about housing, about schools, Absolutely. about the NHS. What's your answer to that Absolutely. and the ratio Kerry, of no, immigration said, to the services that, as a society, we provide? Kerry is absolutely right. Where, for instance, a school uh, has more people, uh, more parents applying to have their children go to the school because of a change in the local population, central government must and does give more money to those schools. Uh, there are about 96% of all people in social housing in this country are, are, are British. 90% of, of all the new employment created in our country over the last year have gone to British citizens. So all I'm saying is, yes, this is an important issue, Kerry. Yes, we should support public services where there are pressures. Yes, let's make sure that our border checks work properly. But let's not, let's not indulge in dangerous scaremongering dangerous scaremongers so no, simply no, no, will no, not no, come No about. housing problem, no schools problem, no NHS problem, of course, in your of course, view. Of course there are. Because there of are immigration. All, there are always problems when you have people. And by the way, this is not just in Europe. When you the have idea, what? Sorry? The, idea, the idea that there will be no problems at all if you are not part of the European Union. There are countries on the other side of the planet where people move from one country to the other. You can't simply wish away the fact that people down, down the centuries have moved from one country right. to, the, to the next. What you need to make sure is that people play by the rules, they don't exploit our generosity through benefits, we support public services, and we make sure okay. that we create jobs in our country All which right. go to the many British people who need N them. Nigel Farage. I'm sorry, Nick. The whole point is we have no idea how many people are coming here from the European Union next year, the year after, or the year after that, because, and I repeat, unconditionally, we have an open door to 485 million people, and many of them, and I feel sorry for them, because they're living in poor former communist countries, and others who took up the ideas of people like yourself and stupidly joined the Euro, 
uh, are now finding themselves forced into poverty, and I fear there is going to be a very big migratory wave from the Mediterranean into Britain over the next few years. Indeed, there was a report out this morning from Migration Watch that said even at current numbers, we've got to build a new city the size of Manchester to cope with immigration over the next four to five years. And what all I right, want, what right, I want uh, is us to get back control of our borders the and be selective well, the about The population of Manchester is just, a, just an interesting thing. <coughs> I heard it again. More, more dangerous scaremongering. The population of Manchester, is, of Greater Manchester, is 2.7 million. It is a nonsense, this idea that 2.7 million people are going to come from here. Only 1.5 million well, have come since 2004, right, Kerry, made. and half point of those made. have gone back home. Pa pa pause a moment, because I said we had two questions on immigration, and this is the second one from Simon Locke, which, um, <clears throat> which came into our website. Uh, do you consider the social impact of unlimited e EU immigration to be positive, or has it caused a damaging element of cultural segregation? Nigel Farage. It's interesting because so often the debate on immigration is framed in terms of economics. You know, one side claims it's a net benefit to the economy, and the other side claims actually it's costing us money because we're having to pay for primary school places. But I think the real impact and the real upset up and down this country, the shock, if you like, is that immigration on this scale has changed fundamentally the communities, not just of London, but actually of every city and every market town in this country. And it's happened rapidly over the course of the last few years. It's led to increasing segregation in our towns and cities, which for a country that has always had a great record of racial harmony and integration is bad news. But worst of all what it's done socially, um, it has left, I'm afraid, um, a white working class, and yes, I know educationally, Many have not done as well as we would like, but it's left a white working class effectively as an underclass, and that, I think, is a disaster for our society. I think this really does get down to the, to, to the, to the sort of nub of it, uh, Simon's question, because it is actually about, about our, Nigel Farage and mine, conflicting attitudes towards modern Britain. Of course there are problems in, in some parts of the country where you get a big change in the local population, but on the whole, Nigel Farage says... He basically doesn't like modern Britain. I love the <laughs> no. diversity and the compassion and the outward-facing values of modern Britain. And I think we should be celebrating that, not denigrating it, and not trying to sort of turn the clock back. Not turning the clock back on this issue, not turning the clock back, as Nigel Farage has done by saying that people who are gay are not allowed to get married. Not turning the clock back on women's rights. Nigel Farage has said that women are worth far less in the no, workplace no, if I they want to have children. Not turning the clock back that. by saying that climate change is some conspiracy. Let's Let's go with a grain of what modern Britain is, not pretend that we somehow can turn the clock back to some 19th century bygone age which simply doesn't exist anymore. But Nick, but Nick it, is, it is the duty of government to make sure that its own citizens have got the best chance for advancement that is possible. I mentioned the white working class. I could, of course, in London, have mentioned the Afro-Caribbean community, 50% of whose youngsters are currently unemployed. Well, I mean, I can understand why big business supports you, because what you've done is given us a cheap labour economy. Small business. Now, that's been very, great. very good for big business, been very good for rich people to take on servants, but it has not been good for the people at the bottom of society. And we need to find a way to give people at the bottom of society and to give our young people jobs. And we will not well, do it's that all very well. with an it's open very well. door immigration policy no, look, to southern and eastern it's all, Europe. It's all very and that well. is about putting Britain and British people first. No, it's all very well. It, it, it's all very well for Nigel Farage to sort of pontificate from the sidelines of his taxpayer-funded job in Brussels. This government has, to, has had to sort out the biggest mess in our economy in a generation. We've created 1.6 million uh, jobs. 90% of new employment over the last year has gone to British people. We're giving people huge tax cuts by raising the point at which you start paying income tax. We've expanded apprenticeships for young British people who need to get into work on a scale never seen before. What about that's the, the kind argument? of re that's real solutions what? for the world in the that's way not. that it what, what, is, uh, uh, not what, what, fantasy what, solutions what for a world that doesn't argument, exist anymore. What about the argument that the white working class has been left behind, which Nigel Farage made? I think you always have a problem in a fast-moving world, in an economy which changes. You have particularly have a problem where people's skills are no longer needed because technology right. moves far, because investors need new things. That's why what we need to do is expand apprenticeships, expand training, make sure that people who do come here, for instance, speak the language. I agree. We must make sure How are you people gonna do speak that? the language. 
that would be against the European Union rules. You can't do that. You haven't got this power. Yes, you haven't do. got this control. Yes, I would be all for, Nick, yes, an do. immigration policy based on people speaking English, having skills, and being law-abiding citizens. We do not have that yes, power as members of the European Union. Yes. That's the truth of it. Well, right. it's, no, no, are, you, are you done on that? We'll move on if you are. Uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, just, just a word, we're sort of halfway through. Uh, you can join in this debate um, by tweeting your thoughts using the hashtag uh, Europe Debate, one word, or go to the BBC's live web page at bbc.co.uk forward slash politics. Right, now, uh, we come to one of the biggest issues, perhaps, of the uh, European Union, with which we've touched on it, but it's about the economy and the effect on the economy. And Jeremy Nicholson is here with a question on that. Jeremy Nicholson. I work for manufacturing industries who want to remain as part of a single European market, but their competitiveness is being undermined by costly environment, climate, energy and social regulations. Can the EU reform itself in these areas without Britain threatening to withdraw? Can the EU reform itself without Britain threatening to withdraw? Nick Clegg. Yes, I think it can. I think it can. But as I said earlier, you can only reform something if you are prepared to put your shoulder into it and, and lead. And that's why I don't think simply isolating ourselves is going to lead to the reforms. Well, I want more trade, I want less bureaucracy, I want less red tape. That's why I'm very pleased with the fact, because I've always felt there was just too much red tape, by the way, not just European red tape, but also national red tape, on, on small companies. And that's why we've, as a government, actually negotiated a complete moratorium on new red tape, European red tape, being imposed on small British companies and indeed small companies across the European Union. We need to go further. It's why I want to see us complete these big trade talks with America, for instance, which would be worth over £400 to every single individual in this country. It would be worth billions of pounds for the European Union as a whole and for British business. But you only, you only measure up, you only have the clout to negotiate on an equal footing with a big economic superpower like the United States if you're prepared to be part of an economic superpower on this side of the Atlantic. Simply hovering somewhere in the middle, in the mid-Atlantic, neither one side or the, uh, or the other is going to help British business in the end. Uh, the answer is no. I, I see no prospect of the European Union changing its environmental policies. Uh, the belief in Brussels that global warming is happening is absolute. Now, whether they're right or not, is actually irrelevant because what Europe has done is declared unilateralism. We will unilaterally make sure that every consumer has expensive electricity and will make it as difficult as possible for our manufacturing industries to survive. Think about this country. You know, we are responsible for something under 2% of the world's global CO2 emissions. And right at the very moment when the Chinese and the Indians have gone for coal on a scale we can't fathom and are building four new coal-fired power stations every week, and the Americans have gone for shale gas, meaning that their gas and electricity prices are less than half they are in this country. We've gone for wind energy and expensive costs for industry, and we're losing our manufacturing base for this simple reason. 40% of the cost of an average factory is its energy prices, and I, you know, there is no way we can combat global CO2 emissions without the Indians and Chinese and the Americans working with us. This act of unilateralism is damaging British industry. The real, the real, the real problem um, about the way in which energy is priced and imported into Europe is actually our over-reliance on oil and gas from Nigel Farage's friend Vladimir Putin. That's the problem, is that there are too many European countries who are only importing oil and gas from Russia. That means we basically have our energy policy set by other people. It means there's great volatility in the prices. That's why I think we need to have actually closer cooperation between European uh, countries. The national grid in this country, for instance, has estimated that if we build new interconnectors between ourselves and our European neighbours, we could reduce the cost of energy in this country by 13%. No. That is a major saving. This idea that we can be completely isolated on the one hand and then have Europe over-dependent on Russian and oil, ga uh, oil and gas is somehow a solution to our long-term needs. Never mind the need to deal with climate change is a complete and dangerous fantasy. It's interesting, Nick, you didn't tackle wind energy, did you? Um, wind energy I, I, is I, I, wind I noticed, energy, renewable I, I energy. That, the, that many of our leading politicians have family members who are or have been associated with the wind energy industry. Um, it's very, very good for rich people. Very good indeed. If you're a landowner and you get £1,000 a day for just putting wind turbines on your land, isn't that great? 
Uh, and the fact is we've committed ourselves to something that has made the rich richer, the poor poorer, has not actually helped the environment at all, and is putting British industry, aluminium smelting, steel making, cement making, it's leaving our shores and going to other parts of the world just... that don't abide with these no, rules, no, and you... it's bad for Britain. When you do... what, what... What, what... what steps would you take about uh, climate change? If you were outside the EU, what would you like to see happen in Britain? Well, I think that the, uh, in terms of energy production, uh, I mean, clearly nuclear energy is the carbon-free way of providing electricity. Uh, but it takes a long time to get nuclear going. And I want cheap energy, Nick. And I'll tell you what, in the northwest of England, we are sitting on a shale gas field that is absolutely huge. If we do what the Americans have done, we can bring down the price of energy by nearly 50%. Sure. And I would say, let's not look a gift horse in the mouth. Scrap wind energy, scrap the subsidies, scrap the money for the rich landowners. Let's get fracking in the short term and let's make sure we can give industry and ordinary people value for money. Okay. Nick, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm, going to move, I'm going to move on because I'm trying to keep an even balance between the two of you and you slightly have the edge in, I was going to say verbosity, I don't mean that. <laughs> I mean, you've spoken a bit more than uh, Mr Farage has so far. So let's go to this question from Natalie Towers, please. What would the, would the effects be on the UK's bargaining position in trade negotiations if we were no longer a part of the EU? That's one for you to start on, Nigel Farage. Very interesting, actually. One of the things that's been sold right from the start is we have to be part of a big club to have clout. That's the word Nick uses, to have clout on the world stage in trade. Do you know, when the World Trade Organization meets to discuss global trade, the British representative is not allowed to speak, and there have been occasions on which the British representative has been asked to leave the room whilst Guatemala and everybody else are allowed to be there. We have given away our ability to make our own trade deals with the rest of the world. We now rely on an unelected Dutch bureaucrat, who I bet nobody in this room could name, and he's now in charge, not just of the UK's trade policy, but of it for another 27 different countries. Um, and I personally think uh, that if we did what Switzerland do, or Iceland do, we'd be able to negotiate our own trade deals. And those little countries have done deals with Japan and with China, which we haven't managed to do as part of the European Union. We have no influence globally as part of a European Union on global trade talks. Nick Na Natalie, where are you? I couldn't... Uh, ah, there you go. Natalie, I think it would be um, very detrimental indeed to the United Kingdom, to us, if we were to seek to renegotiate the 50 trade agreements that we have by way of our membership of the European Union. We'd have to, on top of that, renegotiate with 27 other countries within the European Union. So that's 77 countries. You'd have to renegotiate some, but clearly not all, of the trade access that we presently enjoy. Look, unlike Nigel Farage, I actually used to negotiate some of these trade mm. deals on mm. behalf of British business and European business. It is simply not true to say that British negotiators are not in the room. It is simply false. It is the British Parliament that uh, mm. ratifies these agreements. But crucially, here's the point, is what kind of world you know, do we think we live in? Nigel Farage thinks that we live in a world where we can cut ourselves off, we can be isolated, and that we don't gain by working with other countries when measuring up to some of the big new powers on the global stage. India, America, China. These countries are not going to take us as seriously as they take the world's largest economy of which we are a member right now. Nick, Iceland has 320... <laughs> Iceland has 320,000 people and she negotiated her own free trade deal with China last year. Switzerland has more free trade agreements with the big economies of the world than we do as part of the European Union. And to say we're not good enough, we're not capable of making our own trade agreements because we'd need to have lots of them, shows that you, frankly, don't believe in this country and don't believe in the ability of the people of this country to govern themselves. No, of, course you, of course we can make Of course we can make our own believe. trade policy I tell you what I don't believe in. I don't stand on our own two feet. I, of course we can do that. And to say that we can't, I think, is defeatism. No, I tell you what I don't believe in. I don't believe in the dishonesty in saying to the British people that we can turn the clock back. What next? No, we're going are you going to say, we're going going to say we should return to the gold standard? No, we're going or a predecimal currency? This is the 21st century. Or maybe get, century. Or maybe get W. G. Grace to open the batting for England oh, again. Dear, this dear, is dear. the 21st century. Yeah. It's not the 19th well. century. Now, Nigel Farage, I've heard this many, many times, and you'll hear it this evening, says that we should be like Switzerland or Norway. Let's just think about that for a minute. Switzerland and Norway have to pay into the European Union coffers. 
They have to obey all European Union laws. That's why they call it fax democracy in Norway. Everything gets decided by everybody else in Brussels. They then have to transpose it into law in Oslo. They have no British MEPs, no, uh, no Norwegian or Swiss MEPs or commissioners. In other, they have no passport no. checks. They have no power whatsoever. All the rules are made by foreigners. Utter powerlessness. That is how perverse the patriotism of Nigel Farage has become, that he now advocates yeah. that we become like two countries that have less power than we do in the world's largest economy. I, right. Nick, 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 you talk about modernity. You are advocating the continued membership of a customs union. It is the only customs union of any size that exists in the whole world. It is a 19th century concept based on building a club and protecting yourself against the rest of the world. It is not fit for purpose in the 21st century, and that's why people with real experience of economics and from a standpoint of total independence like Nigel Lawson say, we now need to get rid of this outdated model and move into the modern world. The European model is outdated, crumbling and failing. We deserve something much, much better what, than that. What do you make view. of the argument? Um, what do you make of the argument that Nick put that these countries that uh, have these relationships appear to be outside the EU but have a trading relationship in effect have to do what they're told by the EU without having any voice at all within the EU? Well, Mexico has a trade deal with the European Union and if Mexico sells... You weren't goods... citing Mexico, you were citing Iceland yeah, yeah, yeah. and Switzerland. Well, in fact, it wasn't that he was citing Norway and Switzerland. Both Norway and Switzerland sell about 75% of their overseas goods to European Union countries. To maintain free markets, and to avoid an argument, they pay a small subscription. Their goods... Freedom of movement. Their, their goods, Fre freedom their, of movement. Well, that's up to them, and the Swiss have recently voted, of course, to potentially but, but change the, that or end that. But the Norwegians but, have free, but, but, freedom of movement. But, but, but David, the point is, if, if, you know, if we sell goods to North America, yep. we have to conform to the standards of North America without having a direct say over the regulations in North America. Wherever you trade in the world, you, you know, if we sell motor cars to America, they have to be with the steering wheels on the other side. That's just the way that it is. But what people who buy and sell products do is they adapt. All right. It's called business. We're, we're, all right. We'll, we'll, we'll go on. And this is a, a question that was sent in by email. It's come from Anne Turner. This is the question. What's the point of having a general election when whoever we vote for cannot do what they promise, even if they want to, while we're dictated to by unelected bureaucrats in Europe? Where is the democracy in that? Nick Clegg. <laughs> this is, this, uh, Anne, quite rightly, sort of lifts the lid on a really important issue. Nigel Farage says we must take power back. I say by being isolated, by cutting ourselves off, by making us less powerful, we will have less influence over the world in which we inhabit. The reality is we can't change it that we live in a world in which climate change crosses borders, which criminals cross borders, in which terrorism cross borders, in which there are challenges and opportunities which we deal with better together than if we are apart. It's actually funny enough, if in a slightly different context, an argument we're now having about whether Scotland should remain part of the family of nations in the United Kingdom. I believe, I believe that it would be better for Scotland to be part of the family of nations of the United Kingdom, not because it will rob Scotland of the identity of, of Scottish nationhood, but because there's so much we can do together that we can't do Okay, apart. we mustn't turn exactly this... Exactly the same, exactly yeah. the same uh, lesson applies... I, I don't to want to turn this into a debate on the Scottish referendum. Let's leave that to one side. Nick Farage. Um, no, it's Nigel, honestly. Nigel, uh, sorry. I know you're trying not to agree with either Nick, but... Um... <laughs> I try to disagree with both of you. <laughs> um, Anne, uh, great question. You know, Canada lives next door to America. Japan lives next door to China. They do mass massive amounts of business with each other, uh, but they have their own democracies and their own rights of self-government. Uh, general elections have been rendered, frankly, fairly impotent affairs because we've given away the control of most of our country. I was astonished last week in the first of these debates when Nick Clegg claimed that only 7% of our laws are made in Brussels. He said it was there in the House of Commons library note um, and, and therefore was unequivocal. Well, I've got the note with me, Nick, and on page one it says the British government estimates that around 50% of UK legislation comes from Brussels. Uh, there are other estimates. There are other estimates coming direct from the European Commission that over 70% of our laws are made in Brussels. And in Germany, they reckon 84% of their national Big laws losses. are Big made losses. somewhere else. It's time we said, let's run our own democracies in France, Britain and Germany, work and trade together in a European club, but not in a political union. Bring back democracy.
Uh, are you, uh, when you say 70 percent or whatever, you're talking yeah. about regulations or laws? You're talking about major well, report, things well, or well, the well, details? Well, what's interesting? Maybe I can help. Yeah. What, what, what is interesting is the House of Commons library is very clear. doesn't report, include EU regulations. That's the point. Okay. It, 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 it actually says two, three things, rather. Firstly, 7 percent. 7%, no, not 75%, which was the figure cooked up fictitiously by Nigel Farage last week. 7% of primary legislation is derived from the European Union. 14% are what they call statutory instruments. Those are also laws, but they're, they're done through secondary legislation. And then they say it's difficult to estimate exactly how many non-legislative regulations are produced. But then no one says that this fictional figure of 75% has any bearing in reality at all. So all I would say is let's have this debate not based on scaremongering, not on some sort of dangerous fantasy or con, but actually on some of the realities that we have to have to face as a modern So are there, are there no unelected bureaucrats in Europe? There are. There Is are, there a democratic there are, deficit? Exactly, the, the, the total size of the European bureaucracy, this monstrous superstate that Nigel Farage talks about, is about exactly the same size as the number of people employed by Derbyshire County Council. Uh -huh. Some superstate. But surely it's what they do uh, that matters, you know, not they, the numbers. They're not. They're not but look, we've heard, we've heard, I've, there, heard, I've they? heard all evening. We've all, we've all heard all, all evening. Are they? We've heard they're all evening. Apparently, hmm. the European is going to have its own army. It's going to have its own air force. Yep. It's, this, it's this huge superstate that is trampling on our liberties. In fact, the reality is 7% of our primary law is it derives right. from the European Union. Oh, the reality is the bureaucracy oh, is no, no bigger Farage, than the people employed no, by Derbyshire is, County Council. I'm sorry. I said yes to these debates. I thought you would honestly make the pro-EU case. By saying 7% of our laws are made in Brussels, you are willfully lying to the British people oh, about the extent to which we have given away control of our country and our democracy. And I'm really shocked and surprised that you would try and do that. <laughs> Well, I, don't, I, don't, right. I don't think, in a debate like this, Nigel Farage, you should start making things up to make a point. Well, you've done rather well no, with it so no, far, Nick, no, haven't you? No, so there no. we are. As I All say, right. the House of Commons Library says 7% of the right. primary Look, there there it is. All right, right. Let's, not, let's not go into this. I mean, there, dear, there are, dear, dear. All right, you have different interpretations. What are we do? I'm sure our fact-finders at the BBC website will be able they to will. say who, whose side they're on on this. We go on to another question, though. This is from Sheila Campbell, please. Sheila Campbell. If the British public are deemed intelligent enough to vote for their own MPs, then surely they are intelligent enough to decide whether to be part of the EU or not. The last referendum was 40 years ago and was on the question of trade, not on the federalisation of Europe. Nigel Farage. I couldn't agree more. Uh, do you know what really matters about this debate, and it's great that we're actually at last after 40 years debating the issue, but what really matters at the end of the day isn't what I think, or what Nick thinks, what the chairman thinks, or you think. It's what the British public think, and they should be given a free and fair referendum and the opportunity to express that. But the problem is that, you know, the elite club of career politicians and big businesses don't want you to have a say. You know why? Because they think you might give the wrong answer. They think you might say, no, we'd rather govern our own country. And the sheer duplicity and deception of the political class on this issue it really is a wonder to behold. You know, Nick, you yourself have done it. You know, it's time for a real referendum. That was you back in 2008. And when you were challenged on it last week, you said, read the small print. Well, I have read the small print. And it's totally and absolutely clear that a referendum is vital. And there's no get out clause at all. And Nick turned his back on it. David Cameron gave us a cast iron guarantee of a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. If he became Prime Minister, he turned his back on it too. A Miller ban, well, I've no idea, frankly, where he stands. It's about time we had our say. It really is. Nick, Nick Clegg. Sheila, my, my opinion hasn't changed over many, many years, including uh, in 2008, when we, as a country, were asked to give up new powers to the European Union. The government of the day said we must do that uh, uh, through something called the the, the, the Lisbon Treaty, so when the rules change, and I said then, and I believe now, that when the rules change, when there's a new treaty, when, new, when powers which rightfully belong to you are being given up, if you like, to the European Union by a government, it shouldn't be for that government to decide. It should be for you to decide. That's why there should be a referendum every time that happens. Now, we've gone further, actually, in this government. One of the first things we did in this government was to translate that into law, so you'd have a legal guarantee in law 
that when there's a treaty, when new powers have been given up to the European Union, that is not going to happen over your heads, that there'll be a referendum. Now, Nigel Farage and others want a treaty today, or next Tuesday, or next Wednesday. I think that would put the econo economic recovery at risk. But there's a guarantee now in law that when the rules change, mm -hmm. when new powers are given but, up to the European Union, mm -hmm. there will, there must, and there will be a referendum. But the Sh trouble is, Nick, the trouble is, Nick, nobody believes you. Nobody believes you. And since you've been together in this coalition government, you've given away a vast chunk of control over the management of our financial services industry, our biggest employer. You've given aid and encouragement to the formation of a European external action service, namely an emerging European foreign policy. And tomorrow, when there's a vote in Brussels tomorrow in the European Parliament, every single directive that gets voted on adds to the body of law and the power and control of the European institutions. This isn't about lines in the sand coming every five or 10 or 20 years with a treaty. This is about, as the lady says, a genuine anger an anger amongst the over 57s, many of whom voted, for, I'm not suggesting you are for a moment, by the way, but, but you know, anger that they voted as my mum and dad did for a common market that turned out to be something different. And the majority of us, you know, and I'm 50 tomorrow, so I'm hardly young, who have right. never even Nick, had the chance to express an Nick, opinion. Nick, and we want to do it now. Nick, Nick Clegg, can I, can I ask you something coming out of what you said? And the questioner, Sheila Campbell, said, we last had a referendum 40 years ago. You've described everything that's happened since, the Lisbon Treaty and all those things. Why can't there be a referendum on all the things that have happened? Why wait for even more change sure, before I, you agree to a referendum? I, 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 accept, I accept Sheila is not going to be satisfied with my response if Sheila wants uh, a, a referendum now, immediately. Uh, by the way, people who don't believe there should be a referendum at all are not going to be satisfied with my response either. I've been very clear, I've had the same view all the time, that in a parliamentary democracy such as ours, you don't have a referendum every time there's a little tweak well, or change or an amendment. Right there, wasn't no, because in 2008, when that leaflet was issued, let's be absolutely clear, we were being asked as a country to ratify something called the Lisbon Treaty. It was a big rewriting of the rules. That is when you should have a referendum. I think if we were to have a referendum right now or next week, I think given that we're at such a delicate stage of our economic recovery, which is so important, I think that would be put at peril. I'm not prepared to do that, but we put All into right. law the guarantee there'll be a referendum what when the rules change no, again. Hold on, we've, we've, we must move on. We've got time for just one more yeah. question, right. which I'd like to fit in. Uh, it's from Clive Hamilton, please. Clive Hamilton. What will the EU be like in 10 years? What will the EU be like in 10 years? Nick Clegg? I think it'll be very... Where are you, Clive? I can't... There you go. Uh, I, I suspect it'll be quite similar to what it is... Now, I think if you look at the history of the <laughs> European Union, the main, achievement, the main achievement has been this creation of what they, people call the single market. Uh, by the way, a creation uh, of Margaret Thatcher, Nigel Farage's great uh, heroine. It's created this huge marketplace of 500 million people who buy our goods, who, who trade, completely un, un, unhindered by endless rules. And I think that will remain the absolute heart of the European Union. And the fact that over 3 million, some people estimate over 4 million, jobs in our country are linked to our presence in that huge economy, I think that is incredibly important to us. That's why I think at the end of the day, the most important reason for us to remain in the European Union is jobs, 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 and I think that'll be the case in 10 years' time, just as it is now. All right. Nigel Farage, what well, will the, the good be news like? Is, the good news is, the most upbeat point of the night, is that in 10 years' time, we won't be members of the European Union. We will have had our referendum. We will have got our democracy back. And I hope, and cross my fingers, particularly for the sake of those people trapped in that idiotic Eurozone down in the Mediterranean, I hope that by Britain's example of breaking free of political union, of showing we can trade and cooperate and be friends with our neighbours without signing away to the European Commission and others um, our hard-won freedoms and birthright. I hope by example uh, that the rest of Europe will follow us too. We live in a Europe of democratic nation-states that trade together. We will not ever go to war together. And that will be a far better way than, frankly, this trap that so many of those countries stuck in the Eurozone now find themselves in. I want the EU to end but I want it to end democratically. If it doesn't end democratically, I'm afraid it will end very unpleasantly. Sorry, um, uh, what, what do you mean by very unpleasantly? Well, we already, David, in, in some countries are beginning to see uh, the rise of worrying political extremism. There is a neo-Nazi party in Greece that looks certain to win seats in the European 
Parliament. Uh, we see in Madrid, we see in Athens, you know, very large protests, tens of thousands of people, a lot of violence. If you take away from people their ability through the ballot box to change their futures because they've given away control of everything to somebody else, then I'm afraid they tend to resort to unpleasant means. And that's my big worry. Well, Nigel Farage has been a Euro politician paid for by you in Brussels for 15 years now, and year in, year out, I actually got elected as a Euro MP on the same day as Nigel Farage. I've heard the we same were. thing now for a decade and a half. The world's going to come to an end. The European Union must come to an end. Everything's going to fall to bits. It hasn't happened. There are huge difficulties in the Eurozone. But the idea that it is somehow a good thing for Britain or a good thing for Europe to want to see it to fall, fall apart, to perhaps even predict, as Nigel Farage has just done, that they'll do so with violence on the streets across Europe. And at the same time, to side with Vladimir Putin on some of the biggest issues, rather than our that. own country, than the European democracy we work together with. I just think it's a huge difference in priorities. I think we should be making the best of our membership of the European Union, not always seeking to destroy the things we've achieved right. together with other countries. Well, Nick, I would just say this to you, uh, that have we taken your advice as recently as 2009 and ditched the pound and joined the euro, we may well find ourselves in a similar position to one or two of those Mediterranean countries. And you may have a strong conviction and passion for the European project, but frankly, when it comes to the euro and immigration and the effect in, on ordinary people's lives, you've been proved wrong again and again and again. We just have a 15 seconds before we well, go into my the My passion is what I think is right for Britain in the modern world. I don't think we can sort of turn the clock back to a world which doesn't exist anymore. I think we are, I think we are always better when we work with other countries on, on issues. Climate change, I know Nigel Farage denies that it's in my mind climate change exists. Terrorism, crime, all the kind of things we can't deal with on our own in this, right. in this modern world of ours. Well, I suppose we'd better draw this to a close because you, have, you each have a minute. I don't know whether you're talked out, but you each have a minute for a closing statement. And Nigel Farage, it's you to go first. Thank you. Uh, this is our country. Uh, it is a very good country. It is a country that actually developed the principle of parliamentary democracy. Uh, it has been given away uh, through a whole series of lies and deceits. And even if the common market might have been a good idea 40 years ago, it's certainly hopelessly out of date now. Let's take back control of our country. Let's control our borders and have a proper immigration policy. Let's stop giving away £55 million a day as a membership fee to a club that we don't need to be a part of. Let's re-embrace the big world the 21st century global world. Let's strike trade deals with India, New Zealand, all of those emerging, doing superbly parts of the world. Let's free ourselves up. And in doing so, let's give an example to the rest of Europe. I know the people are behind this. And I, might, I would urge people, come and join the people's army. Let's topple the establishment who've led us to this mess. So it's time for you to choose. There are people like uh, Nigel Farage who shun the modern world, want to turn the clock back to a world where it was all so much more simple. I don't know, Britain had the empire, women knew their place and stayed at home, people who were gay were not allowed to get married, where we didn't have to deal with complicated things like climate change. And then there are those of us who believe, who believe and love modern Britain as it is today, compassionate, diverse, outward-facing, who understand that there are complexities and challenges in the modern world, but who also understand that by working with other countries, we deal with those challenges and we make Britain richer, stronger and safer. In short, real remedies for the way that the world is today, not dangerous fantasies about a bygone world that no longer exists. And that is why I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that we remain part of the European Union, because that is how we protect the Britain that we love. So that's our hour of debate over Britain and the EU come to a close.